right, this is the continuation of our presentation on the Australopithecines and early members of genus Homo. This will correlate with chapter 10 in the Explorations textbook, chapter 10 in the Essentials textbook, and also goes along with lab number 15 in the Biological Anthropology lab manual. So this slide we're going to look at some of the changes that we see from late Australopithecines into early members of genus Homo. So the three main changes we're going to see is cranial capacity, brain size is going to increase slightly. Uh, we are going to see a significant increase actually until we get to Homo erectus and onwards. So most Australopithecines, both gracile and robust forms, as well as the pre-Australopithecines have a cranial capacity that is relatively small you know, between about 350 to 500 cc's. So that's in, within the range of what you'd see in most modern day chimpanzees. Early genus Homo, you see a slight increase. So on average, somewhere between 500 to 600 cc's, um, but not a significant increase in cranial capacity until we get to Homo erectus, which we'll talk about in the next PowerPoint presentation. So with Homo erectus, the inclusion of more meat in the diet is proposed to be one of the main reasons why we see a significant increase once we get to Homo erectus. Since the brain is a very metabolically expensive organ, it likely required the inclusion of a higher quality protein in the diet. Uh, but still, members of genus Homo have a generalized or omnivorous diet, which means that they included plant materials, fruits, nuts, insects, um, seeds, and possibly more meat once we get to genus Homo and onward. Um, we're also going to see some cranial shape changes. So for genus Homo, we have a much more rounded, globular cranial shape. The mandible is getting smaller. Uh, zygomatic arch is getting smaller. And we also see a decrease or a decline in postorbital constriction, which we'll, we'll talk about more in the next slide once we can see a picture. Um, dentition is also reducing, especially the posterior dentition is getting smaller, indicating that genus Homo had a much more generalized diet. So there's many hypotheses here. Of course, when we see genus Homo, um, Homo habilis and onward, they're utilizing more stone tool technologies. So they're processing their food prior to consumption, which is reducing the demand on the chewing muscles. And also once we get to Homo erectus and onward, we have the likely control of fire. So if you think about eating a cooked potato versus eating mashed potatoes, or eating a raw potato versus eating a cooked potato like mashed potatoes, obviously it's much easier to eat mashed potatoes. So the, the, the benefit, or at least the dietary benefit to hominins with the inclusion of more tool use and fire is that it's processing that food prior to consumption. So it's reducing that, um, that tension and the wear and tear on the dentition and also the jaw. So you don't see features like a sagittal crest in genus Homo. All right, so this slide here, we've seen this before in the previous presentation, but just to review postorbital constriction. So remember the orbits are the eyes, and the brow ridge is the supraorbital ridge, and postorbital constriction is talking about how far it sinks in behind the brow. So an Australopithecine is pictured here. You're looking at a superior view or a view from the top. So you're seeing here with the Australopithecine, there's a high degree or lots of postorbital constriction, indicating that these are relatively small brain hominins. And then in the middle here, you're seeing this is a Homo erectus fossil. So you're seeing that, yes, there is still some constriction, but it's not nearly as dramatic or as extreme as you see with the Australopithecine. So lots of constriction some constriction, and then by the time you get to Homo sapiens, there is no constriction. So just to prove it to you, everybody feel from your brow all the way up to your hairline, your forehead is very vertical and there is no constriction behind the brow. So this is a feature that we're going to look at in lab number 14, 15, and 16, and it's a really critical feature that's going to help you determine if you're looking at an Australopithecine or a member of genus Homo. All right, Homo habilis has the nickname the handyman because it is believed to be the very first species that relies heavily on stone tool culture. Um, like we talked about earlier in this presentation, it's possible that the later Australopithecines were also utilizing stone tool technology, um, but it is likely that with Homo habilis and, onler, and onward, we see a commitment to using tools and a reliance upon them for survival. 
So Homo habilis in general, slightly larger brain size and also smaller chewing complex. The increase in brain size and smaller chewing complex gave the Homo habilis skull a much more rounded globular shape. And we know that Homo habilis is our users and makers of old one stone tool technology. Uh, other features, we're going to see anatomical evidence from the hand bones that are suggesting more of a precision grip, which would have been really critical for both the use and manufacture of stone tool technologies. Um, tools are becoming much more fundamental to survival, unlike for the Australopithecines. And tools increased Homo habilis' ability to exploit a much wider variety of food sources. So essentially, a much more generalized diet is much more successful. So the more different types of food you can consume, the more adaptable you are. Because if you think about it, if all of a sudden one food resources, resource becomes available and unavailable in your environment, you need to be able to quickly switch to another food resource. So that's been hypothesized to be one of the main reasons why genus Homo was essentially more adaptable than the Australopithecines. It is much more generalized diet, the ability to use stone tool technologies, and then of course later other features like the control of fire, migration out of Africa, symbolic expression, but that's all information to come in future chapters. All right, this is just another one of your summary slides here. So Homo habilis as a species dates between about two and a half to 1.8 million years ago. Um, still restricted to the continent of Africa, this particular fossil was uncovered in Kenya. Uh, features, um, likely still an obligate biped, um, or likely an obligate biped due to the lack of the opposable hallux. So we're transitioning from habitual bipeds now to obligate bipeds, meaning that they're relying predominantly on bipedal locomotion. Um, other big changes increase use and reliance upon material culture, slightly larger cranial capacity um, with Homo habilis, right around 500 to 600 cc's, but again, not a significant increase until we get to Homo erectus. More generalized dentition, smaller premolars and molars, uh, much smaller zygomatic arch, uh, more rounded globular cranial shape. And from the neck down, we're still seeing an Australopithecus-like body plan. So this you know, inclusion of, of, as an obligate biped for Homo habilis is debated. Some would still consider Homo habilis more of a habitual biped since you know, we do still see a very mosaic anatomy from the neck down. So that is the conclusion of the PowerPoint presentation on the Australopithecines and early members of genus Homo. This correlates with chapter nine of the explorations textbook, as well as chapter nine of the essentials textbook, or chapter 15 of the Biological Anthropology Lab Manual. Um, the next PowerPoint presentation we're going to focus on later members of genus Homo, so essentially Homo erectus and onward.